So, where are all the Jews? Greece. Why? That's a good question. Jews have been in Greece for over 2,300 years, a similar amount of time to the Cochin Jews, the subject of the last episode of WWATJ, and it's due to the same reason. The block was hot, and they had to move around. Hmm. You might hum, in your best impression of Michael Brooks from the Majority Report's best impression of Sebastian Gorka. Rest up, King Michael. Could this infiltration of, shall we say, Frankfurt School neo-Marxist intellectuals have perhaps been the beginning of Greece's radical socialist tendencies? I don't know. Let's check it out. The Jewish presence in Greece dates back over 2,300 years, with the first reference to a Greek Jew appearing in an inscription dated between 300 and 250 BC in Oropos. The individual in question was Moshos, son of Moshion, the Jew, who may have been a slave. In the 2nd century BC, a statue was raised of a Jewish community leader named Hyrcanus, Hyrcanus in Athens. There is a less solid account from Greek historian Clearchus of Soli that Aristotle met a Greek Jew in Asia Minor in the 4th century BC, writing, The man was a Jew of Koli, Syria. These Jews were derived from the Indian philosophers and were called by the Indians Kalani. Now this man not only spoke Greek, but had the soul of a Greek. During my stay in Asia, he came to converse with me and some other scholars to test our learning. But as one who had been intimate with many cultivated persons, it was rather he who imparted to us something of his own. Nice. The oldest synagogue in Greece, which is also the oldest synagogue found in Diaspora, is called the Delos Synagogue. It is dated between 250 and 170 BC, and it is Samaritan. Are Samaritans Jews? Interesting question, me. Interesting enough for a whole video, in fact. Interesting enough that I wrote a huge amount of notes and ripped video clips in preparation for answering it here. But that journey leads us so far away from our original goal, and it'll have to wait. But I still really want to talk about it, so here goes. The original kingdom of Israel lasted between 1030 and 930 BC, at which point it split into the kingdoms of Israel in the north and Judah in the south. In 732 BC, the Neo-Assyrian Empire annexed part of the northern kingdom and deported the population around their empire, but came back ten years later, resulting in the destruction of Israel, also called Samaria to distinguish it from OG Israel, in 722 BC, upon which they ethnically cleansed the rest of the population, moving those they didn't kill. Meanwhile, the kingdom of Judah got caught up between an ascendant Egypt and the Assyrians, and though they held out until the neo Assyrians became the Neo-Babylonians. The Neo-Babylonians eventually destroyed their temple in 589 BC and took the kingdom's population to be slaves in Babylon, where they weren't allowed to return until the Persians conquered Babylon in 539 BC. Shoutouts to Cyrus the Great. At which point everyone had come back to the land, pointed at each other, and asked, who are you? The Samaritans claim that they are the descendants of the exiled tribes of the north, and the Jews claim that they were Neo-Assyrian people who moved into the region and adopted the religion. I am more inclined to agree with the Samaritans because there is historical evidence for their deportation and gradual return and historical precedence for Jews being super dickish about accepting other Jews. Whew. See? I could have said they split from mainstream Jewry in 722 before Christ's end. But wasn't that cool? Well, I thought it was. And I'm gonna do a video. But anyway, some Samaritans ended up in Greece and built a synagogue. Yeah. There is also a Hellenistic Jewish synagogue in Athens from 300 AD, showing that the blending of the two cultures had already long since occurred. The word to describe the Jewish courts of the time, Sanhedrin, is actually a Greek word, but I'll get into that in the future. The fusion probably began after Alexander the Great's conquest of the Kingdom of Judah in 332 BC and the wars between his generals after his death. Israel was caught between the Greek Seleucid and Ptolemaic empires. I'm sorry, y'all. Cleopatra was very Greek and very inbred. But she was the first Ptolemaic ruler to learn Egyptian in 300 years of their rule. 
It actually wasn't bad as Jews spread out across the Greek world, all through North Africa, all through Southwest Asia, and into Southern Europe and Greece. These Hellenistic Jews were actually distinct from the Jews of Judea by the time Greece fell to the Romans in 146 BC. Jews in Greece were speaking a Greek dialect and living Greek lives, while back in the Middle East, the new Hasmonean dynasty was fighting against their Greek rulers. While the Romans took over and the Jews rebelled in the first Jewish-Roman War of 70 AD, Greek Jews did not participate, ensuring that while their counterparts were slaughtered, enslaved, and shipped across the Roman Empire, they could do cool Greek stuff, like eat those little stuffed grape things, or get unfairly blamed for causing the 2009 Euro crisis. They did well under the Roman and later Byzantine empires, barring some massacres, crusades, and forced conversions once Christianity took off, with Romanio Jews and rites spreading within the empires. From Greek-speaking southern Italy to the Balkans to Crete and Cyprus, all through Turkey and even to Crimea, where a community of Tartar Jews called Krimchaks practice Romanio Judaism to this day. About Romanio rites and customs, Nusach and Minha, Romania, respectively. They are distinct from Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Mizrahi, and all the rest's rites and customs. For example, they read the Torah portions or Parsha on the ancient Palestinian triennial cycle, whereas most Jews read it on an annual cycle. The Torah is also housed in Tikim, which is derived from Greek meaning container. The Torah is never completely taken out of the tik and is read standing upright. They also have a birth and circumcision certificate known as an olive, which is passed down to ward off Lilith. They have unique cantillations, I think that's a word, based on Byzantine melos and pray in Greek and Hebrew, but they used to pray in Judeo-Greek. Most crucially of all, they do not eat rice on Passover, unlike these Fua Sephardi Jews and the rest of the Jews in Greece. I'm sorry, Sephardim. I love you. But Pesach should be hard. Anyway, run it back. Judeo-Greek? Yeah. It's another Jewish Creole language called Yavonic. Like the rest, it's critically endangered today and only a handful of people speak it in Greece and Turkey. Very cool, though. Anyway, more history. They had a great run in the Byzantine Empire until they had an absolutely shit time during the Crusades, and then the Black Death hit. But then came the Ottomans. Mehmed II, after taking Constantinople, finally, in 1453, began a resettlement program to repopulate the worn-out city. They moved a lot of Jews in there, to the point where Constantinople was 10% Romanio. They weren't happy about it initially, but they settled in eventually. The Ottoman Empire was gigantic and diverse. When Europe went through its centennial Jewish massacre and purging in the 1400s, the Ottoman Empire provided a haven for these erstwhile Bolsheviks from Russia to Iberia. The majority were Sephardi Ladino speakers, which is a Jewish Spanish language and very cool, who came to outnumber and eventually assimilated most of the Romanio community in the empire. The urban center of Thessaloniki, or Salonika, I'm sorry about my Greek pronunciations, was called the Jerusalem of the Balkans. It had been a big city under the Byzantines, and under the Ottomans, it went crazy. The Ottomans took over in 1430, and Jewish exiles from Hungary, Bavaria, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Sicily, Austria, and France began pouring in. By 1519, there were about 20,000 Jews in Thessaloniki, which was about 56% of the population, and by 1613, they were 68%. They remained the majority of the city until 1902 when the last Ottoman census was conducted before the Greeks retook the city. Even then, they were 49% of the city, with 62,000 Jews. Greece was pretty good to Jews too, even granting them equal rights in 1926. But 
Unfortunately, this unprecedented European pro-Semitism couldn't last, and Greek Jews were about to see what fuckery the rest of Europe was on. After the Greeks and Albanians clowned Paper Tiger Italy in World War II, Germany stepped in. They occupied Greece in 1941 and moved Jews into the ghetto near rail lines and began shipping them out. 96% of Thessaloniki's Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. Only Polish Jews were killed at a higher rate. At Birkenau, 37,000 Salonikans who survived the trains were immediately gassed on arrival, mainly women and children, and the rest were worked to death. Meanwhile, their homes were looted by their Christian neighbors. The Greek resistance was realer than most of the European resistance is. The French. But don't get it twisted. Athens did a better job but Athens also had less Jews. About 20 Greek Jews managed to escape and join the Polish resistance, where they fought and likely died in the Warsaw Uprising. A few others managed to organize, and on October 7, 1944, they attacked German forces in the camps, blowing up the crematorium and killing 20 guards. Before being massacred, they apparently sang a song of the Greek partisan movement, and the Greek national anthem. Between 83 and 87 percent of all Greek Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. So yeah, that sucked. We're not in China and India anymore, that's for damn sure. As cool as Greece is, we are definitely in Europe now. You know what else is in Europe now? Not that many Romani out. It was hard for surviving Jews to get their stolen homes and property back, and most just left. And that's not saying Greece was particularly bad. Greece was actually the first in Europe to allow it. But it's hard to move back into your house when someone's living there. Just ask the Bosnians. Or the Palestinians. Today there are about 6,000 Jews in Greece but only 1,500 Romaniot. Wikipedia does say that there are 45,000 in Israel, 6,500 in the U.S., and 500 in Turkey, but it's citation needed. I, for one, think the decline of the Romaniot is ass. But I'm not blaming you, Greece. Just like in 2009, we all know it's the Germans' fault. Modern life for Greek Jews is not bad. You do get some anti-Semitic incidents, but not like in France or Germany, or the US. Greece does have a neo-Nazi party called Golden Dawn. They deny it, and I have no reason to doubt them. I mean, look at that unique and unthreatening flag based on an ancient Greek symbol and nothing else. Yeah, they've typically been too busy beating up immigrants to beat up Jews. They got about 7% of the vote and 17 to 21 seats in Parliament between 2012 and 2015. But then they murdered an anti-fascist rapper named Pavlos Faisas, and they've been going downhill since. So yeah, it's all good. Damn, this is depressing. I miss the Ottomans. Anyway, is it Fu? No. There's DNA and an unbroken history. Are there any celebrities? Well, there's Sabatai Zevi, who was a pretty successful false messiah in the 17th century. Ugh. How about a fun fact since that was garbage? Sefer Yosipon is a chronicle of Jewish history from Adam to Emperor Titus, compiled by Romaniote Jews in the 10th century, and edited and translated by another Romaniote Jew, Judah Leon ben Moses Moshini. Moshini. In the 14th century. The book was very popular, and in 1558 it was translated into English, sparking the least evil incarnation of British interest in Jews to date. With English people wanting to know about Jews, this book and other things led to Oliver Cromwell allowing Jews back into England for the first time since 1290. Good looks.